Okay, am I on? All right, good. So, good afternoon, early evening to everyone. Thanks for coming out today to hear these presentations. And as she said, my name is Susan McKay, and I am the CEO of Siri Helix. Siri Helix is the company that is commercializing the technology upon which my moonshot is based. So, uh, there we go. So, imagine you've already taken the moonshot, and so you're out in space looking back towards the planet Earth. I think you'd be hard pressed from this vantage point to imagine that there's anything like a water crisis that's evolving on this planet. In fact, from space, you would see very obviously that the planet probably even shouldn't be called Earth, since 75% of our surface is covered by water. However, out of that water that we can see, only 3% of it is actually usable to humans who live on, the, who live on this planet because only 3% of our total water resources is actually fresh water, which is the water we need to grow food and to drink directly. And out of that 3% of total fresh water, less than 1% of it is actually accessible because the rest is either locked up in polar ice caps or is trapped under the soil. So there is a limited resource of water on our planet and out of that limited resource, it's very fixed. We don't create new water, for instance. So how you perceive the water issue on our planet has a lot to do with where you live. This is a picture from my neighborhood in Maine. This is about a block from my house. And up in Maine, it's very hard often to perceive that there is something like a water crisis. However, if I lived at the mouth of the Colorado River, which is also in the United States, I might also see a different perspective of the water crisis on the planet. And that difference of point of view is whether or not you live in an area of water stress. And water stress is the term where people don't have access or ready access to clean and fresh water. So the water resources exist, but for either practical reasons of cost or just accessibility in terms of transportation or, ex or the fact that the water is too polluted to use, that creates water stress. Right now, a third of the world's population lives in a region of water stress, and in 10 years, that number will be two-thirds of the world's population. So the real, the, the way that water stress is growing throughout the world is due really to a fundamental conflict between two resources, water and energy. And the interrelationship of these two resources is what's known as the water energy nexus. And essentially, technologies have grown up independent of each other to manage and access these resources. In the area of water, we have, in the US especially, developed a system of distributing water and treating water that was really developed more than 60 years ago and is based on technology that was developed at that time as well. And so water filters were really developed out of materials that were readily available and that could be cheaply produced and they didn't worry so much about how much energy it costs to either treat the water or to centrally treat the water and then distribute it over large geographic areas. So our water treatment and our water distribution system was built up without really thinking about its impact on energy, which was readily available and plentiful. Consequently, the way we produce energy in this country, both by traditional means and newly emerging means, can be very water in, and is very water intensive. So we use a lot of water to produce energy in this country. And you might say the most innovative energy technology that we're currently utilizing is in the oil and gas industry and the unconventional fuel um, extraction, which many people know by the name of fracking. And so in the area of unconventional fuel, they actually utilize a large amount of water and move a lot of water resources around to extract this fuel. And in fact, they use it in a very low-tech way. If you've been in Pennsylvania in the last 10 years, you'll have noticed a growth of, in the middle of the woods, large um, highway systems where they literally have tr lines of trucks that are transporting water out of the state. And that's a very energy inefficient way to deal with water. So for this industry, over a 20-month period in 2011, the oil and gas unconventional fuel industry in the U.S. consumed 65 billion gallons of fresh water. And so the impact of that on our water system and on their own industry is driving that industry now to really look at ways to better reuse and recycle the water. And a lot of that is for many, the same reason anyone wants to reuse and recycle water is to do it in what they call a point of use. So actually to treat the water at the site of where it's being contaminated in a way that more cost effectively allows you to reuse that water. 
This both saves them money because they're now no longer using the energy or the costs of moving water around, which is a very inefficient way. So going back to the theme of the moonshot, is fracking in many ways is to water technology startups like my own company, it's kind of like the space program of today. There's a lot of money and there's a huge engineering effort that's gone into building out this industry. And it's happened over a short period of time. And right now, they actually deal with more volume of water than they do with oil and gas. So the, the water that's produced on these sites is very highly contaminated. It's done at large volume, and it's a very expensive process and a very high, you know, very sort of financially intensive industry. And so what you've seen is all the water technologies currently being developed, they all, we're all looking at the same opportunity. There's opportunity in this oil and gas produced water space to develop our technologies and to prove them out in sort of this space age style phenomena where literally billions of gallons of water are being pumped down into the ground. They, they're being cycled through, coming back up along and having to be separated out in these very contaminated um, systems. And they're, they're storing the water, they're trucking the water, they're treating the water. They're, they've started just sort of using every water technology that was available and they clued together ways just to get the job done. And now this, as this industry is somewhat maturing within itself, they're finding more and more stresses as they're trying to expand and they just, they're just dealing with more water issues every day. And so for a company like ours to work in this space, it's a way to rapidly prove our technology and fund its development. So what they t turned to first in this industry was really looking at what was the tried and true. They, if they were looking to get water to very high purity, and, and the reason for them to do this is that in order to reuse and recycle this water, it has to be close to fresh water um, composition. And that's because they use a chemistry package to do the fracking. So if, if they're going to recycle and reuse the water rather than just re-inject it in the ground, they need to get it to a high level of purity. When they tried to use more traditional high purity filtration um, membranes, they found that they fouled too much and they weren't rugged enough. And they were, in some one case, they told us they were replacing the filters every day. So they looked at materials that were more durable, like ceramic filters, and they, they work really well. They actually like ceramic filtration in this industry. But the problem is the ceramic filters that have been developed to date were really developed at not a high enough purity level. So the Siri Helix opportunity was to combine for the first time using a very durable material, creating a very high purity membrane that could be used to filter these types of highly contaminated water, and doing it in a very energy efficient way. So whereas before water, water and energy were optimized, technologies were optimized independent of each other, we for the first time developed this technology with an eye to making it you know, truly energy efficient. So the way we did that is typically the way a ceramic filter is made is you take very small ceramic particles and you fuse them together and the space between these particles is the pathway through which filtration occurs. So the smaller the particle size, the more fine the filter is. In the Siri Helix method, what we did is we take polymer in a different state, more amorphous um, ceramic polymer, so a ceramic material that's now more amorphous, and we incorporate DNA into this material, and we use a chemistry whereby the DNA is distributed throughout the material and is highly aligned within the ceramic. We then apply heat, after which both the DNA is removed and the ceramic material is hardened. And this creates straight aligned channels through the material, which provide a means for things to rapidly transport through the material and be filtered. And in fact, the pore size we're able to achieve, which is basically how small the holes are, it translates to how fine a filter it is, were significantly smaller than those which can be achieved both in the more traditional ceramic processing method, where they're actually using ceramic nanoparticles and fusing them together. So even with what they called nanoceramics, there's still a much larger pore size and so not as fine a filter as ours. And in fact, we avoid some of the issues that people are seeing with nanoparticle types of um, products where we don't actually create a nanoparticle that then can become another issue. Um, we're actually, for our nano piece of our technology, we're using DNA. So here's some electron micrographs, which are the very high resolution pictures of a cross section of our membrane. So underneath our, the very top layer, which is circled up there, is our actual membrane. So that's the material that we're creating. And it sits on top of 
the rest of the ceramic, which is sort of more in the ball shape that I showed before. And that's so once something can actually penetrate through our membrane, it rapidly travels through the rest of the filter and you know, is a very much faster process and way to do the filtration. So you can see in the more high resolution image on the right, our material looks you know, significantly different. So you can see sort of the physical differences between the type of ceramic material we're working with as opposed to the more traditional um, ceramic that looks more like a particle or a distinct particle. But even at this high resolution, you can't actually see the channels. So we back out that information to sort of characterize material by using um, indirect methods like absorption. So here is an absorption um, profile of the material with the DNA still incorporated. And then when we heat it up and remove the DNA, the smaller um, pores pop up, which sort of demonstrate what our pore size is. So it's less than a nanometer um, in terms of its size. So how does this fit into filtration? Well, more typically, filtration has always been developed to treat water. And so typically, ceramic filters have been optimized in what they call the ultrafiltration range. And that's where you we really wanted to remove contaminants in water to make it drinking water quality. So things like viruses and bacteria that you typically just care about in order to create good drinking water. God. Sorry. Um, with the Sierra Helix technology, we've been able to take ceramic filters into a new regime. And that's where we're now actually targeting things that are dissolved in water. So with the Sierra Helix technology, for the first time, we can remove um, organic materials or, or, or contaminants that are dissolved in the water that are much smaller than what you could filter out with other ceramic membranes. So here is just some preliminary data from some where we actually targeted compounds of interest to the oil and gas industry. These are, con these are contaminants that they have trouble dealing with now. And they're each um, significant in that barium sulfate on the left, the, um, the blue bars is essentially the water that we treated. And then after filtering, the yellow um, is now the level. So we're in both cases with a single pass able to remove nearly 80% of the contaminant found in those water samples. And the significance of barium sulfate is when it comes up with the produced water, it also carries with it absorbed radium. And so you get a radioactive waste that's generated. And it also is a scaling compound. So when it's dissolved, if it doesn't get removed from the water, the dissolved component, and you try and reuse that water, it can actually impact the drilling equipment. So this is a, a high profile. Um, this is, has a lot of um, high profile in the industry to try to deal with barium sulfate. Benzene as well is a um, volatile organic car, um, compound which is very uh, carcinogenic and toxic. And it is another issue, it, it represents a class of materials that also cause problems when they try to reuse and recycle the water for fracking. So the fact that we optimize our technology in this space also provides a way then to take these same filters and apply them to other filtration um, areas and other industries and other end users who also want to remove these same types of compound from the water in order to reuse or recycle that water. Um, especially in the case of benzene, benzene is one of those carcinogenic um, compounds that for two million people in a Chinese city last April created a lot of problems that they couldn't use their tap water because it became contaminated from the oil industry. And so I think I said two million people. Um, so in this one city in China, they've already dealt with issues of these contaminants. So it's, it's not just people sitting in a fracking well that want to reuse their water. It's sort of everyone who lives more and more as we're seeing more people live in urban areas. There's a drive to recycle and reuse water. And that kind of gets us back out to the big problem at the global level of how do we deal with our diminishing access to this fixed supply of fresh water. There's two technology ways available to us. We can try to create more fresh water. So you can take salt water and convert it to fresh water. Or you can take the fresh water that we're currently using and polluting and treat that and reuse it and recycle it at the point of use. And right now, more and more people in the world are living in urban areas. And urban water recycling is four times more energy efficient than desalination. Plus, unless your urban center happens to be located at the coast, which many urban centers are, but not all, it becomes prohibitively more expensive even once you've desalinated that water to transport it to the point of where it's going to be used. And really, in urban water, the contamination is much greater. You tend to have more industry in those areas and more point sources of pollution, like, for instance, hospital water, where we're now seeing more and more dissolved drug residue and pharmaceutical residue. And there's a whole um, list of different types of contaminants, which are beyond what our earlier version of water treatment is capable of dealing with. 
So we're really looking, what the world really needs is new technologies that can now treat this water to the level needed to create clean, safe drinking water for everyone. So where are we in our development? At Siri Helix, we incorporated in 2011 specifically to commercialize this technology. We own the IP. We've developed all to date everything within our own laboratory, solely sourced with um, federal grant money. So we have had more than $2 million in SBIR money go into our company to get the point where we've taken the idea and we're now creating commercial scale filter tubes out using our process. So we're currently coding out in our laboratory meter long filter tubes using our DNA ceramic technology. And these are what we're working with end users who are testing and validating our, techn our product in their laboratory and, and in specific um, sort of experiments, if you will, in either in their lab or in ours, where they're trying to see how well we separate, how inexpensively we can actually, re, you know, in terms of energy use and costs, treat the water to the level that they need. So we're benchmarking and validating with a series of different um, partners. But what we need to do next is really go out into the field and pilot test our technology. And this is a pathway that other companies have gone with new water technology, especially in the oil and gas regime. So not only do we need to build out our pilot scale capabilities in terms of the test systems that we take, we also need to build out our ability to manufacture larger and larger quantities of our membrane. And so we're really expanding into early stage or next stage manufacturing. Right now we have a, a small site, a laboratory and clean room that we, that we lease currently, and we're looking to expand that. So it's not just the capital that we need to build that facility or to build that pilot system, but it's a human capital as well. You know, in the United States, there's a lot of um, polymer chemists, and there's a lot of people who focus and deal with filtration, polymer filtration. But ceramics is more of a niche in our country. It's much more widely adopted in Asia and Europe. And so really, especially being located up in Maine, human capital is extremely dear. And so we look to really partner with people who have expertise in this area and to collaborate more and more broadly with um, universities and other partners who can help us get access to the people and the expertise that we need to get our company to the next level. And so with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention.